Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Jack Gallimani, congressional reporter and author of the Power Up Political Newsletter. Carly Fiorina, a former presidential candidate and CEO of Hewlett Packard, and now the chair of Carly Fiorina Enterprise, is joining us today. Welcome, Carly. Thanks so much for, for coming on. With you. I think the last time I saw you was somewhere in New Hampshire. Um, so nice to <laughs> see you on Zoom today. Yes, probably somewhere in New Hampshire is about right. <laughs> uh, let's start with Liz Cheney. What's your reaction to the removal of, the, of Liz Cheney from the number three position in the House GOP conference? Well, it is further evidence that the current Republican Party has lost its way. But honestly, I stood up for Liz Cheney and continue to talk about Donald Trump's corrupting influence on the Republican Party, a subject I've been on since 2015, because it's much bigger than Liz Cheney and it's much bigger than me being a Republican. Our democracy cannot function if you have a president claiming that the only way he can lose is if the election is rigged. That's what President Trump said over and over and over again in 2020. You cannot have a functioning democracy if a president, once he loses, continues to say that the election was stolen. You cannot have a functioning democracy if elected officials of one of our two Republican parties uh, to political parties goes along with that lie. The, the election was stolen. We must have, in order to have a functioning democracy, we must have both political parties accept the legitimacy of elections, especially when those elections have been described as free and fair and legitimate by observers on both sides. If we cannot accept the legitimacy of elections and we cannot have a peaceful transfer of power, we do not accept the legitimacy of those who were elected. We don't accept that elections have consequences and therefore we cannot have a debate about how to achieve our constitutional principles and ideals. So this is a big deal not just for politics, not just for the Republican Party. It's a big deal for us as citizens and for our republic. But you're an outlier when it comes to being a Republican who acknowledges the reality of the facts at hand, which is that there has been no evidence of widespread election fraud as the president has, as the former president has claimed. Why do your Republican peers continue to propagate the former president's lies? Well, it's a great question, Jackie, and it mystifies me. My only explanation is that it is purely political opportunism. How sad is that? That in other words, these elected officials have decided that in order to win back the majority in 2022, and let's face it, politicians are usually all about winning, that they're prepared to throw out facts, truth, constitutional principles, the rule of law, and continue in their slavish devotion to Donald J. Trump. I can come up with no other explanation, but it is a very sad commentary. And for those who might say, oh, I don't care about politics, or even those who are cheering the demise of the Republican Party, I would just go back to what I said at the top. This is about far more than the Republican Party. This actually is about our republic. And while we're on the topic of political opportunism, were you surprised by Elise Stefanik's public willingness to back the former president and take out Liz Cheney from her leadership post? Well, sadly, not really. I mean, honestly, there are so many people who have surprised and disappointed me, not just in the last two weeks, but in the last two years and beyond that. So she's just one among many. And talk about opportunism, she saw an opportunity for a big promotion. And so she jettisoned her principles like so many and now appears about to get that big promotion. And you and Congresswoman Stefanik, I feel like, are were at one point pretty ideologically aligned. And you both have really gone out of your way to try to recruit more women into the Republican Party. What's your relationship like with her? I was trying to dig through FEC reports this morning um, to figure out whether or not you've previously donated to her? 
Uh, I don't believe I have. Uh, I, I don't actually think I've ever met her. So um, I don't, I wouldn't say we have a relationship. Have you been in touch with Liz Cheney since uh, throughout this in entire saga? I haven't spoken directly with her, but our staff certainly have been in touch. And um, I applaud Liz Cheney's courage, as I've said publicly. Honestly, I didn't really need to be in touch with her. To me, it was so obvious that what she was doing, what she continues to do is the right thing. And I think all of us as citizens, whether we're Republicans or Democrats, if we care about our republic, we need to stand up for people like Liz Cheney, like Mitt Romney, like Adam Kinzinger, like the people who came out in the Washington Post today, people who are prepared to just say some basic truths that we have to accept elections that are legitimate and the consequences of those elections. And I was taking a look at just some of the headlines about House Republicans from yesterday alone. Um, my colleague Mariana and I witnessed Marjorie Taylor Greene verbally accosting Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez outside the House chamber after votes. Um, you saw a House Republican reduce the January 6th insurrection to uh, a tourist committing, some tourist committing vandalism and questioning whether the mob was even made of Trump supporters. Uh, and then, you know, to end the day, uh, again, Liz Cheney was ousted from leadership for her lack of fealty to Donald Trump. What's, you know, what has happened to the Republican Party that you uh, once were running for uh, the the leader, the top leadership position of? Well, Donald Trump happened to the Republican Party. That's the short answer. And since 2015, I have consistently said that Donald Trump is corrupt and corrupting, and that he would corrupt the Republican Party. And unfortunately, that has happened. Um, that's the simple answer. Now, it's also true that Donald Trump won more votes in 2020 than he won in 2017. So there is something about his message that is appealing to people, and Democrats need to understand that. However, this is about, as I keep saying, this is about far more than the Republican Party or politics as usual or even who wins what elections. Our republic cannot function without two strong political parties, both of which accept fundamental constitutional principles and fundamental facts so that we can, in fact, have a debate about ideas, which is necessary in our republic. It's necessary to solve problems effectively, to have a debate of ideas. But the, that debate has to be grounded in constitutional principles and fact. And yes, it would be helpful if that debate were grounded in civility and mutual respect as well. Do you believe that Liz Cheney would have been ousted if she was a man? You know, I don't know. Maybe, actually. <laughs> Maybe she would have been ousted if she were a man. It's hard to say. But uh, she certainly wouldn't, a man certainly wouldn't have been replaced by a woman. I mean, this is all about, unfortunately, the tableau looking right, the picture looking right. Um, that's sad. And speaking from the House floor on Tuesday, Cheney said that every one of us has sworn the oath who has sworn the oath must act to prevent the unraveling of our democracy. This is not about policy. This is not about partisanship. This is about our duty as Americans remaining silent and ignoring the liar. The lie emboldens the liar. Why is this a controversial statement? <laughs> I have no more explanation than the one I keep coming up with, which is sadly uh, too many in the Republican Party whether they are elected officials or those that support them. And sadly, a lot of people still support them. Sadly, those elected officials believe that they will win if they stay on the right side of Donald Trump. And staying on the right side of Donald Trump apparently necessitates supporting his lie that the only reason he lost is because the election was stolen from him. And therefore, more and more people need to stand up and speak the truth. Good for Liz, but it can't all be on Liz Cheney. 
all of us, whether we're Republicans or Democrats alike, have to stand up and speak. And so I'll continue to do so, uh, just as I always have from the moment Donald Trump glided down that escalator. Right. And that is something that you are doing right now through Carly Fiorina Enterprises, helping inspire the next generation of female leaders. What is your message to young women in the GOP or aspiring uh, young women who want to get into the Republican Party or Republican politics? My message to anyone who aspires to a position of leadership, whether it's to the GOP or the Democrat Party or in an organization, a nonprofit, a business, is this. A leader must have courage to see the truth, speak the truth, and act on the truth. I have been saying that for 30 plus years in every conceivable setting, the boardroom, um, a nonprofit, and in politics. A leader has to have the courage to see the truth, speak the truth, and act on the truth. And frequently it is a leader's role to hold the mirror up so that other people can see the truth and then find their own courage to speak the truth and act on that truth. That's what leaders do. So if you aspire to leadership, don't think you're gonna just go along to get along. That's not leadership. That's going along to get along. And ultimately, the impact you have will not be that for which you are capable. And Kamala Harris is our nation's first female vice president, obviously. She is a Democrat, though. How does the Republican Party need to grow in order to let women and minorities know that their voices are welcome within the party? Yes. So first, when Kamala Harris was nominated by uh, now President Biden, I tweeted out my congratulations. I don't agree with her on everything. Nevertheless, when anyone breaks a barrier, we all should applaud. Because when anyone breaks a barrier, as she has done, we see the promise of this country fulfilled. And the promise of this country is that it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from or what your circumstances are. The true promise of this country is that you can fulfill your potential here. And so when Kamala Harris breaks a barrier, yay. And I think what the Republican Party needs to do is first decide that it wants to be a majority party. And to be a majority party, the Republican Party must look like the nation it wants to represent. So it has to make that decision. I start with that because the Republican Party doesn't appear to be making that decision right now. The Republican Party appears to be saying, we're okay with being a minority party. The Republican Party appears to be saying, we're okay by driving forward on new laws that have no bipartisan support, whose purpose is to make voting harder. The Republican Party appears to be saying, we're okay being a minority opposition party. And as long as that's the decision and that's the message, then they won't attract people who look like America, whether those are women or people of color or all of the wonderful diversity that we have in this nation. And we have two excellent audio, uh, audience questions that I want to get to. Don Oslo from Washington, D.C. asks, why can't Republicans say no to Donald Trump? <laughs> well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And I think, again, the only explanation I could come up with is way back to what our first president said. Our first president, George Washington, warned in his farewell address to the nation in 1789, the trouble with political parties is they will come to care only about winning, not about principles or governing. And I think the Republican Party came to care only about winning. Look, history is filled with examples of how seductive power is. That's why our founders were so concerned about the concentration of power and worked hard in the Constitution to try and constrain and distribute power. So a whole bunch of people in the Republican power, Party got seduced by the idea of power and winning. And Donald Trump struck a chord 
with a whole bunch of voters. And we need to think about what chord he struck. Look, I hold elected officials and leaders responsible for the fact that too many Republican voters think the election was stolen. That's not the voters' fault. That's their leaders' fault, because it is the elected leaders who kept telling them the election was being stolen and continue to tell them that it was stolen. But that's why, I guess, because they thought Donald Trump helps them win. Yeah, I, I do think, though, it's, it's worth pointing out that, yes, Donald Trump won the presidency, but under his four years, the Republicans then lost the House, the Senate, and then the presidency. So it yes. does. And Jackie, to your point, it's such an important point. You see, I think the Republican Party is making a short term decision, which will cost them in the medium to long term. I think they're saying, you know what, we think we can win again in 2022 with Donald Trump. Well, maybe they can. Maybe they can, given what's up and how districts are drawn and where Trump voters are. Maybe they can. But over the medium to long term, they will lose and they will become if they continue down this path, a permanent minority party. And that is not good for our republic. And Sherry Kaur from Tennessee has a question that I wanted to ask you, but we'll let her ask it anyways. I supported Carly financially when she ran for president, and I'm interested in any future plans she has for running for office. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Sherry, for supporting me when I ran. Uh, I don't currently have any plans. Uh, I've learned never to say never, uh, but I don't have any current plans. And you were Ted Cruz's vice presidential running mate in 2016 when he ran against former President Trump in the GOP primary. Have you talked to Ted Cruz lately? Uh, we have exchanged texts. Uh, he was not happy. <laughs> that I said I was disappointed with him along with a lot of other uh, Republicans. I continue to wish him and his family well, but I supported him because I did not want Donald Trump to be the nominee of our party because I believe he is corrupt and corrupting. Um, I disagree strenuously with the path that Ted Cruz and others have taken. What exactly has disappointed you about Ted Cruz? Did, did you relay that to him in reference to the January 6th insurrection? I have said publicly over the last several weeks, and in fact, several months, that all elected officials, including but not limited to Ted Cruz, needed to stand up and number one, accept that Joe Biden was our legitimately elected president. I congratulated him the almost to the minute the election was called. And there continue to be way too many Republicans who have never accepted his election. Let's start with that. I've said publicly that the insurrection on January 6th needed to be condemned in the strongest possible terms, as did Donald Trump's role in fomenting it. And <laughs> to drum Liz Cheney out of leadership, to criticize her because she has stood up and said, the election was not stolen. Joe Biden is the legitimately elected president of these United States. And Donald Trump should not be the center of the Republican party. To stand up and condemn her instead of applaud her, that too is not only disappointing, it's dangerous. And why do you think that Senator Cruz has latched on to the issue of the unsubstantiated issue of election fraud? Do you think that his calculus is that it's helping him set up the stage to run successfully for president in 2024 or 2028? I don't know what his motivations are beyond the motivation that I've ascribed to all elected officials in the Republican Party who continue with this fiction that the election was stolen or that January 6th was a tourist attraction gone awry, or that Biden isn't the legitimate president. My only explanation is they're focused on short-term political gain, political expediency, and clinging to power. 
I want to talk about, though, going forward. You know, a recent NBC News poll found that 44 percent of Republicans said they support the president more than the GOP, compared to 50 percent who said that they support the GOP more than the former president. Does this give you hope that the movement can succeed? Well, look, I always (laughs) have uh, optimism that given enough time and enough information, most people will come to the right choice. They need enough time and they need enough information. And one of the things that's very difficult in politics, but it's also difficult in business and in the nonprofit organizations that I work with every day, one of the difficulties of today's environment is getting the right information because people can go and get only the information they want and ignore anything that challenges their point of view. That's dangerous in politics. It's also unproductive in organizations. But if people are given enough time and have enough information, most of the time people will come to the right decision. So I think this is going to take time. I think there needs to be a constant flow of facts. No, the election was not stolen. Yes, we have a legitimate president. Yes, January 6th was an insurrection. Yes, Liz Cheney is right. We need to have a constant flow of the real information. We need to have some time. And over time, people who continue to support lies need to lose. And people who support facts and the truth need to win. But how do you change Uh, How do you change this cycle that we're seeing play out right now? Because there have been never Trump movements since Trump's ascendance. And Liz Cheney is really just the latest. And she's lost her position of leadership. Uh, So as you know, as much as you're applauding Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger and continuing to speak out about this former president, what will actually make a change here to to break Trump's grip on the party? Well, you know, Liz Cheney may have lost her position of leadership, but she hasn't lost her platform to speak. In fact, her platform to speak is, I would say, larger than ever. And, you know, it is always difficult. I, through Carly Fiorina Enterprises, I coach problem solving and leadership development and productive cultures and organizations. And the reason I go there is because it is always difficult to stand up against the status quo always. And the status quo right now in the Republican Party is Donald Trump is ascendant. But things never change unless leaders emerge. And leaders are people like Liz Cheney, like Mitt Romney, like Adam Kinzinger, I hope like me and other citizens who are listening. Leaders are people who stand up against the status quo, who don't go along to get along and see the truth and speak the truth and act on the truth. And so more of that is required. Is that an easy fix? Will it happen tomorrow? No, but that is actually what's required. Who are those leaders for you? Is there anyone you have your eye on who you're trying to recruit or who you've taken out your checkbook for recently? You know, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the upcoming political cycle, um, because, again, I think this is about something a lot bigger than who's running in a particular district. I mean, yes, ultimately, those things are important. And uh, I've signed a fundraising letter for Liz Cheney because I want her to keep her position. I think it's important that she be reelected in the state of Wyoming. But again, I think this is bigger than the Republican Party. So Democrats who are joyfully dancing on the Republican Party's grave need to stop and think about the bigger picture here as well. And you supported Joe Biden in 2020. Why do you still call yourself a Republican? (laughs) Well, sometimes that's a really good question, Jackie, and sometimes I... Uh, ask myself that given the current state of the Republican Party, but here's why. Because I believe that power concentrated is power abused and that we concentrate way too much power 
in Washington, D.C. and in big bureaucracies in Washington, D.C. Because I believe that people closest to the problem know best how to solve the problem. And so that we need to send money and decision-making authority to communities and to states where they understand the problems better and resist the national one-size-fits-all solution every single time. And most importantly, because I believe that every individual regardless of who they love, what they believe, what their appearance is, what their circumstances are, where they come from, what their last name is, that every individual is filled with potential. By the way, every individual born and unborn is filled with potential. And that this has to be a country where every individual has an equal access to education, we're not there yet, equal access to quality health care, we're not there yet, equal protection under the law, we're not there yet. Because I believe all those things, I continue to be a Republican because I think we have a different way to achieve those ideals. However, let me quickly say that we're never going to achieve those ideals of equal protection on, under the law and equal opportunity to fulfill your potential and access to quality education and quality health care unless we embrace those goals, both political parties, and then have a free, respectful, civil, and sometimes fierce debate about how best to achieve those ideals. Well, that was actually going to be my next and probably final question for you. We've talked a lot about personalities and cult following throughout our interview, but the policies that you think that the Republican Party should be zooming in on and how to best achieve and accomplish some of the goals, what do you think those are? So, for example, I have said publicly, I embrace President Biden's goals of rebuilding our infrastructure, rebuilding our middle class by tackling finally um, child care, family support, access to education, to the internet. And I also support the need to tackle climate change. I believe that a functioning Republican party would say, for example, that the way to achieve those goals is not simply to throw more money at already vast and frequently unaccountable bureaucracies in Washington, DC. The right way to achieve those goals is to embrace innovation and entrepreneurship, to put more of the decision-making in local officials' hands, to go to business as a partner. Business does understand how to get things done. To go to business as a partner and a problem solver, not just a way to pay for this stuff. I think there are other ways to get to these goals, but I agree with the goals. Carly Fiorina, that's unfortunately all the time that we have today. It was really great to see you. I'm also loving the silver streaks in your hair. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jackie. Great to be with you. Please stay tuned for the Post Live at 1 p.m. for a deep look at infrastructure with my colleagues Jonathan Capehart and Senator Thomas Carper and Julia Hamm, the president and CEO of Smart Electric Power Alliance. And tomorrow we've got Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg joining us. Thanks so much and we'll see you later.